Okay, well, let me uh, welcome all of you here to uh, this evening's lecture. My name is Neil Safir. I'm the director of the John Carter Brown Library. And it is uh, my special pleasure to be uh, welcoming you and to be introducing our introducer uh, this evening for what is the second in a series of lectures that are being held over the course of this year to uh, commemorate and to give a historical context for the founding of Brown University um, in 1764. Um, this is a joint uh, lecture series that was organized by uh, the Department of History in conjunction with the John Carter Brown Library, as well as a series of different centers and institutes around campus that have joined us for specific thematic lectures that relate directly to their, um, their topic or their sort of area of study. Um, special mention should also be made to the intellectual architects of this series. Uh, my colleague Lynn Fisher from the Department of History, who is taking some time away from his very cherished time at the Newberry Library on leave to join us this evening, so we're happy to have him here. And my colleague here at the library, Margot Nishimura, um, who put uh, this uh, series together last year in conjunction with a lot of different partners. Uh, this is, so um, we have lectures that are going to be coming up uh, on October 21st, uh, George Marsden in conjunction with the Department of Education, and uh, November 18th, Colin Colloway, uh, who will be coming in conjunction with the uh, Hoffenreffer Museum of, Anth of Anthropology. Uh, tonight, we are uh, joining forces, so to speak, with the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, a, and we are very excited to be able to, um, after the lecture, have a reception in their uh, new digs over on uh, Waterman Street and to uh, celebrate the, uh, this collaboration um, and other kinds of collaborations that the library and the center will do in the future. I also wanted to mention that um, this date, uh, September 11th, uh, 2014, was not chosen at random. Uh, it was on this date, uh, 250 years ago today, that um, a ship called Sally uh, made its way from Providence to the west coast of Africa. Um, as many of you uh, know, this was a ship that had a very important role in the conversations that emerged uh, about Brown University's engagement and activities uh, in the transatlantic slave trade. Um, it also happens to be a ship whose uh, documents we hold here at this library. And so this offers us an opportunity to remind ourselves that the history of, uh, of this university is um, embroiled in other uh, kinds of global contexts, but also it's the responsibility of institutions like this to not only maintain documents uh, like those of the Sally, but also to interrogate them and to bring them uh, more firmly to our uh, attention. Uh, this is uh, not only uh, going to be a talk, as you'll see, about uh, the slave trade, however. In fact, uh, it is also, and most importantly, about ideas of race and race relations in the broader transatlantic world. So this has been a, this is a movement uh, in the scholarly direction to really expand uh, the focus uh, of the slave trade and think about other contexts in which um, uh, we might be able to take advantage of a deeper understanding of the global context for, um, for, this, uh, for these voyages and for these interactions. So um, it's my uh, pleasure at this point to introduce to you uh, this director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, Tony Bogues, who will introduce our evening speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Neil. Good, um, good late afternoon to everyone. I want to begin introducing uh, my colleague, Professor Craig Wilder. 
uh, with something he said fairly recently. This is what Professor Wilder says. Uh, Thinking for a living is an extraordinary privilege, a joy, end of quote. So says Professor Craig Wilder, historian, professor of history, and the chair of the history department at MIT. It is clear that history for Professor Wilder is about hard thinking. And it is hard thinking because history, as Professor Wilder says, often has to wrestle with difficult, divisive, and ugly social realities, he says. He continues, teaching history is not about making people feel badly about the past, but it is about a honest engagement with that past, end of quote. Professor Wilder's work has been about that kind of honest engagement. From his book, In the Company of Black Men, then A Covenant with Color, to his latest book, Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's University, Professor Wilder has been probing that most difficult question of American history and American contemporary life, race, slavery, and American society. As the recent events in Ferguson has shown, the question of race is still one of the most difficult issues. But it is difficult not because it is troubling. It is difficult perhaps because we have not yet had a major public conversation about the meanings of race and racism in America. Facing this difficulty, wrestling with it, is at the invitation of Professor Wilder in his work. In other words, what he attempts to do is to practice a certain kind of vocation of history in which he grapples with the past. Because as he says, we can't run away from the past, it follows us. With a PhD from Columbia University, an academic career that took him to Williams College where I first met him when I went to give a talk there, and he was at the talk and we had a set of discussions, to Dartmouth College, where we often spoke when I went to visit Dartmouth, to MIT, Professor Wilder has emerged as perhaps in the nation's, one of the nation's most preeminent historians in questions of slavery and race. But this is not all he is. Beginning his career as a community organizer, he has not forgotten his roots. He has stayed true, if you wish, to where he came from, the community of Brooklyn Stuyvesant in New, in, in New York. He works with curricular on curricular development with public schools in New York in low-income areas, and he's a senior fellow at the Bard Prison Initiative, which trains hundreds of men and women who are incarcerated in for college degrees. This is a historian, therefore, for whom legacies, in quotation marks, what I would call the past past in the present, because that's what legacies are, has profound consequences for, and it's a set of consequences in which he attempts to act. Therefore, he is, in my view, one of the most appropriate, if not the most appropriate speaker for this particular series on trying to think about formation of brown in the world and trying to think about the early global context of that formation. It gives me great pleasure to ask him to speak to us. Craig. Okay. I was quite nervous before that introduction. <laughs> and, uh, um, after he had converted a number of Mohican families in a village east of Albany, New York, and west of Stockbridge, Massachusetts. The evangelist David Brainerd, quote, gave them a historical account of God's dealings with his ancient and professing people, the Jews. Only a few months earlier, in the summer of 1744, the Reverend Ebenezer Pemberton had used the occasion of Brainerd's ordination 
to remind the celebrants that it was the failure of Christians to convert Jews that forced Christ's disciples to carry the gospel across the globe. Europeans, European Christians, mined Jewish history to explain the origins of the Americas and its indigenous peoples. In 1763, the Reverend Nathaniel Whitaker, who would soon in fact leave for Europe to accompany the Mohegan minister Samson Ockham on a European fundraising tour for the Reverend Eliezer Wheelock, the founder of Dartmouth College. Um, Whitaker marked the ordination of Charles Jeffrey Smith as missionary to the Indians by recalling the disappointing history of Jewish evan evangelization. Quote, the Jews' hatred of the prophets th to Christ and his apostles are evidence, in fact, that people are still set against the faithful ambassadors of Christ. This attention to Judaism was, in fact, more than just sermonic. Christians used the history, culture, and language of the Jews to interpret their American encounters. They searched the Bible for clues to the origins of Native Americans to determine the potential of indigenous people for Christian salvation and to weigh the lives and deaths of Aborigines. They gleaned biblical narratives to position African slavery and Christian teleology and to address the morality of the slave trade. Jewish history provided the scaffolding from which Christians crafted new understandings of their relationships to people in the Americas and Africa. Their history with Jews also contained arguments, positive arguments, for the morality of persecution, from which the colonists invented new bodies of religious entitlement. As the, as the 17th century progressed, European colonists began de-emphasizing the claim that their religion gave them the privilege over heathens, and embracing the possibility that their status as white people made them the natural governors of Indians and Africans, whose conquered and subjected condition reflected inherent capacities. Such proto-biological notions were born in the dynamic interactions of the Atlantic world. The demographic transformation of the Americas um, sorry, affected colonial Christians' views of the world and their faith. The growth of the European American settlements the pervasiveness of African slavery and the catastrophic depopulation of native nations required that Europeans reassess Judeo-Christian history and prophecy. In particular, Christians began to suspect that human communities had natural fates that corresponded to their spiritual fortunes. Speculation about the natural destinies of varied populations of people was, were the beginning of a re-envisioning of Europeans' relationships to all the people of the earth and the conquest of Native American nations and the rise of the African slave trade were early and continuing accelerants to this process. Race making in the Atlantic world, in short, was not a project, but it was in fact a series of consequences. Ideas that explained and legitimated the enslavement of Africans were also deployed to justify the uprooting and destruction of Indian nations and then moved unbound through Western thought. Intellectual assaults upon colored peoples informed Christians' responses to all subject peoples. The century-long descent of the Indian in the English mind, for instance, from lost Jews destined for Christianization and assimilation to a savage and inferior race fated for extinction was one branch of a body of social ideas that transformed the intellectual and institutional cultures of Europe and the Americas. Those ideas had histories. Christians believed Indians to be a lost tribe of Jews. Catholic missionaries in the Spanish colonies, like their Protestant peers, felt compelled to address the lineage of Indians, which had consequences for Christians' relationships with Native America. Early Spanish invaders looked for resemblances between Indian cultures and Judaism, and commonalities between indigenous languages and Hebrew. Um, as we know, Christopher Columbus brought Louis de Torres a converso um, with him as Hebrew interpreter to the people who he might meet on the other side of the world. By the 1560s, Spanish clerics were debating whether Indians were descendants of one of the lost tribes of Israel or if perceived similarities to the Jews were products of a satanic manipulation intended to render them useless to the Christian God. Protestant colonialism brought equal enthusiasm for discovering the Jewish origins of Indians. In his mid-17th century description of New Netherland, the Dutch lawyer 
Adrian Vanderdonk admitted the, the theological pressure. If Christians were unable to reconcile the existence of Native Americans with biblical narrative, then, quote, the doctrines of the Holy Scriptures would be subverted and ruined. Several years earlier, Domine Johannes Megapolensis, whom the patroon Killian van Rensselaer had brought to Rensselaerwick to New, New Netherland um, to minister to the Rensselaer Rensselaerwick colony in 1642, um, Megapolensis encountered an elderly Indian woman who was likely Mohawk and who repeated part of the Iroquois creation story which included, in fact, the story of a divine feud between two brothers. Domine Megapolensis took this as a variant of the story of Cain and Abel and further evidence of the Jewish heritage of the Indians. The Puritan divine, John Eliot, explained his fascination with Native Americans as in part of a product of his hope to quote, that I might find under what covenant and promise their forefathers lived. Eliot speculated that they were descended from Shem, or in other words, he incorporated into, it into the story of the curse of Ham or the curse of Canaan. Other Puritan ministers pointed to a tendency to speak in parables as the link between Native Americans and European Jews. A critic of colonial Indian policy and a founder of Rhode Island, the Reverend Roger Williams, also saw parallels between Jewish and Indian cultures, including the anointing of heads and the exchange of dowries for wives. Rabbi Menashe ben Israel's treatise on the Jewish ancestry of American Indians validated this Christian obsession. The essay repeated the 1644 testimony of Aaron Levi to the Sephardic rabbis of Amsterdam. Levi said that he had encountered Indians in the Cordilleras Mountains of South America who revealed themselves to be Jews who knew the Torah and who traced their lineage to the tribe of Reuben. Thomas Thurgood, the Puritan minister, seized upon this evidence and expanded it. Indians were reluctant to eat swine, he wrote. They often dressed like Jews and intermarried within extended families. Jewish and Indian women offered further evidence of a connection. He postulated, in fact, that an ancient tribe of Jews reached Mexico and Peru where the primary Jewish influence could be seen in temple architect architecture, the practice of circumcision, ritual sacrifice, and the knowledge of the Great Flood. The monumental architecture of Peru, Mexico, and the Mississippi Valley suggested that these Jews migrated north, separating into contemporary nations and undergoing a process of cultural devolution. In 1649, when Parliament ratified Edward Winslow's act creating the New England Company, it affirmed this link to Jewish history. The Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in New England, to the native people of New England, the first of the great missionary, British missionary companies and the model for the ones that will actually be constructed in England and Scotland, um, actually here in New England, becomes critical to this moment. The New England Company promised that education and evangelization, evangelization of Indians would quicken the conversion of Jews and fulfill biblical prophecy. Missionaries were learning Native American languages, baptizing many indigenous people, and beginning the process of bringing Christian Indians, particularly children, into the English towns and households for education and apprenticeship. A work of God, in short, had begun in New England, and Parliament sought to hurry its course. Its progress required, quote, that fit instruments be encouraged and maintained to pursue it universities, schools, and nurseries of literature settled for further instructing and civilizing them. In New Spain, in New France, in New Netherland, and in New England, Christian looked for prophecies of their American experience. In 1652, William Pynchon published a treatise on the ritual and culture of the synagogue from Massachusetts, where there were no synagogues, and where it's not even clear that any Jews had ever visited. That same year, the Reverend Richard Mather of Dorchester ended an essay on the spread of the gospel among Indians with a promise of the inevitable reclamation of the Jews. Toward the end of his career, John Eliot prayed that, the Nat that Native Americans could achieve a more pure embrace of Christ than the superficial conversions of Europe's Christianized Jews. In 1667, Increase Mather asserted again Jewish conversion 
as a stage in the fulfillment of Messianic Christianity. A president of Harvard, Mather continued to insist upon the necessity of evangelizing Jews. Samuel Willard, a Harvard vice president, agreed. And later in the century, Judge Samuel Sewell remained sympathetic to the idea that Indians were Jews and that their conversion was, in fact, necessary. The European invasion of the Americas encouraged engagement with Judaism. In the 16th century, Cambridge University and St. Andrews University established their first Hebrew professorships. Royal endowments then soon funded Hebrew chairs across the universities. Students at Trinity College in Dublin were required to attend Hebrew lectures under John Stern, who also taught law and medicine. The divinity professor at Edinburgh gave a weekly Hebrew lecture, and in 1642, um, the university established a chair in Hebrew. Like many wealthy colonial boys, the second generation Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, also known as Richard the Scholar, studied abroad at Oxford, and his biographer notes that he afterwards made a habit of keeping, quote, his notes in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. European intellectuals attempted to connect Hebrew to spoken and written languages throughout the world. They studied Hebrew as the original language or the Abrahamic, uh, Adamic tongue and searched for its residue in non-European languages to prove the Jewish ancestry of their speakers. By 1655, the year that the Indian College opened at Harvard, the first brick building on Harvard Yard, the faculty had made the ability to, to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek and Latin a requirement for admission, and assigned Hebrew instruction for all undergraduates. Charles Chauncey, President Chauncey, um, who presided over the first class to enter the Indian College, had himself learned Hebrew from a Jewish house guest. His successors in the presidency gave regular Hebrew readings from the Old Testament at morning and evening prayers, Harvard, William and Mary, and Yale, the first colleges in the English colonies, all mandated Hebrew instruction for undergraduates. The belief that Native Americans were wild encouraged the notion that their languages were purer expressions of this ancient tongue. And the history of the Jews helped Christians determine their obligations to Native people. One of the first English colonists to study Algonquian Roger Williams concluded that it shared, I quote, affinity with Hebrew and Greek and held potentially important clues to religious history. In his 1644 description of the Mohawk Nation, Domine Megapolensis dismissed Indians as dumb when they failed to answer questions as he anticipated. Nevertheless, Megapolensis compiled a vocabulary and grammar of the Iroquoian language. While rector of Harvard, Increase Mather sent an update on the Christianization of Native Americans to John Luston, professor of Hebrew at the University of Utrecht in Holland, where, which Luston then used to encourage Indian missions in the Dutch colonies. By the will of God, Cotton Mather proclaimed, Christians were discovering the Indian languages. Reverend Mather then published a short catechism in Iroquois. Latin and English to transform the Dutch and English merchants who were heading into Iroquois into missionaries. And it's for that reason that there was in fact, predictably, extraordinary excitement in Harvard Hall as the governors, faculty, and students joined public officials and ministers of the neighboring towns on March 27, 1722 to celebrate the baptism of Judah Monis. The Reverend Benjamin Coleman, one of the college's most influential trustees and a commissioner of the New England Company, officiated and delivered the sermon. The Harvard Corporation elected Monis to an instructorship in Hebrew, but faculty had to be practicing Christians. At Yale, in fact, the um, trustees' records actually read something very similar, quote, every student shall consider ye main end of his study to know God in Jesus Christ. In 1720, Harvard awarded Monis a master's degree for his Hebrew primer. His public conversion to Christianity was a spectacular moment in Puritan New England. Another century passed before a professing Jew graduated from Harvard College, and Monis was the only ethnically Jewish person to hold a degree from Harvard in its first century. Quote, pray to God for me that he may in his mercy 
often blessed me in the faith of Jesus the Messiah, Monis wrote to the Reverend Robert Woodrow of Scotland, adding that Christianity was, quote, the only and true faith. Increase Mather, the president of Harvard, penned the preface to the conversion narrative, dedicated it to the Jewish nation, and listed fam several famous Jewish converts to display the irreversible direction of religion. For 2,000 years, God preserved the Jews, quote, for some great design, Mather exalted, which he, said, he added could only be their conversion. President John Leverett's decision to shift Hebrew instruction from the poorly trained Harvard tutors to the well-versed and, and traveled Judomanus marks but one step in the cyclical rediscovery of Judaism's value to Christian theology. The faculty mandated Hebrew instruction for sophomores and upperclassmen and required undergraduates to buy Hebrew Bibles and grammars. Leverett gave Monis, in fact, detailed guidance on instructing the boys. Classes met four days each week, including the Jewish Sabbath. Quote, study Jewish letters, Edward Brooks noted in his daybook in early March 1755 during his sophomore year at the college. Although Monis was often listed as an appendage to the faculty and the Hebrew instructor, it frequently or typically read, um, his conversion storified messianic Christianity, and his subject was an important portal to advanced biblical study. In 1766, the college opened a Hebrew school, a dedicated lecture room in the new Harvard Hall. It's important to remember that Christian's comfort with Judaism was greatest in the absence of Jews. The migration of European Jews to the colonies raised new questions and tensions. Puritans prayed for the conversion of the Jews and thus the cultural erasure of Judaism. Dutch colonists in New Netherland sought to keep New Netherland from being, quote, further invaded by people of the Jewish race. Before 1650, a wave of Jews fleeing persecution in the Iberian Peninsula found refuge in the United Provinces of the Netherlands. The growth of Sephardic communities in commercial cities like Amsterdam assisted the rise of Dutch merchant trade in Europe, East India, and the Americas. New migrations of Dutch, Spanish, and Portuguese Jews to Brazil, the Caribbean, and New Netherland followed. During the ephemeral English Republic, Oliver Cromwell ended the four-century-long banishment of the Jews by courting Dutch and Iberian Jewish merchants who brought much-needed expertise in Atlantic shipping, which in fact the English particularly needed to get around Spanish prohibitions. Rabbi Ben Israel dedicated his hope of Israel to Parliament, in part making the argument that if Indians, Native Americans, were Jews, then England was already engaged with a vast, sizable Jewish region of the globe. In 1655, Ben Israel personally petitioned Cromwell for the readmission of the Jews, and under Cromwell's authority, Jews entered England before the prohibition was officially lifted in 1662. In the Mid-Atlantic and New England, Jews faced a vibrant anti-Semitism. In September 1654, a group of 23 Jews from Recife, New Holland, Brazil, victims of the Portuguese conquest, arrived in New Amsterdam aboard the St. Katrina. Captain Jacques de la Monthe stole their, sold their possessions at auction to pay for their passage and then secured a court order to hold two of the men for the remaining debt. Dominique Megapolensis dispatched a letter to Amsterdam complaining about the immigration of Dutch Jews from Brazil. Governor Peter Stuyvesant also protested against allowing Jews to, quote, infest his colony. Johannes Theodorus Polemus, later the Dutch minister out in Brooklyn in the Flatbush uh, settlement, arrived on a second ship that carried another group of Jewish settlers. Domine Polemus had earlier opposed the immigration of Jews to New Holland, and now, in fact, began, began the opposition or added to the opposition of the immigration of Jews into New Netherland. Aggravating Megapolensis' frustrations were that Jews coming to New Amsterdam were poor and needed charity. And he protested that the tiny community of Jews already in the city had given little to their support. Certainly, these Jewish settlers would attempt to establish a synagogue, he warned. 
The Dutch West India Company and the classes of Amsterdam rejected the New Netherlanders' call for exclusion, but inclusion also had clear limits. The Sephardim could practice their faith only in the privacy of their own homes and could not open retail stores. Decorum also required that they build their houses in one section of the city and close together. And that's a quote, close together. The social position of European Jews was in fact increasingly ambiguous. The colonial Jewish population grew slowly but steadily as a network of Sephardic communities helped to link New York to Europe, to Africa, to South America, to the Caribbean. Quote, it is possible to also to learn Hebrew here as well as in Europe, the Reverend John Sharp proudly wrote of New York City in the summer of 1713. Quote, there being a synagogue of Jews and many ingenious men of that nation. Reverend Sharp was a former Indian missionary who had lived with the Mohawk near Schenectady and preached in Mohawk country. Christian intellectuals discovered the utility of these loosely, loosely configured communities of Sephardim. Hebrew, in fact, remained prominent, a prominent part of the 18th century curriculum, but its purpose changed dramatically in the century from its sort of real rise within the curriculum. It increasingly served as a lens into the origins of Christianity rather than for an instrument into discovering the origins of Native Americans and any religious obligations toward them. The Reverend Samuel Johnson, the founding president of King's College, now Columbia University, compiled and published his own Hebrew grammar book. He critiqued others in circulation, but Johnson was also particularly cold to the idea of accepting Native American students on the King College, King's College campus. In fact, one of the few times he even suggests it or writes about it, he quickly decides that it's not worth it um, because what he mostly wants is actually money. Um, not really Indian uh, students. In 1764, the wealthy Boston merchant Thomas Hancock, the uncle of John Hancock, established a Hebrew professorship at Harvard. At the College of New Jersey, now Princeton, President John Witherspoon offered private instruction in Hebrew to his most gifted scholars. James Madison, who had begun studying classical languages while a boy in Virginia, remained in Princeton after his 1771 graduation, in fact, to improve his Hebrew under Reverend Witherspoon's guidance. The second college in the colonial South, the short-lived Queens College in North Carolina, required competency in Hebrew for admission. For a decade before he assumed the presidency of Yale College, the Reverend Ezra Stiles improved his command of ancient languages and religious philosophy by building closer relationships to the Jewish community in Newport, Rhode Island. That's never easy to pull off that water thing. So, um, where the extension of religious freedom in Newport and full civil rights to all free people in 1652 had allowed Jewish settlement. Stiles celebrated the dedication of the synagogue in Newport, often attended services there, became a student of Judaica, mingled with prominent Jews, Jewish businessmen and philanthropists like Aaron Lopez and Jacob Rodriguez de, River, de Rivera, and sought instruction from learned Jews, including the Dutch rabbi Isaac Tura. He learned Hebrew, earned a, the friendship of a half dozen rabbis, and forged close relationships with Jews in New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. Quote, finishing a Hebrew letter to the rabbi Karagal, the minister hurriedly wrote in July 1773, troubled that he had not had time for revisions before the Middle Eastern visitor departed for Barbados. Karagal had served Jewish communities in Curaçao for two years and in Jamaica for a year. Reverend Stiles gave an address in Hebrew at his Yale inauguration. He added Hebrew to the college seal and he secured a portrait of Rabbi Karagal for the campus. If the dominion of Christians over Jews suggested a spiritual hierarchy, then the tyranny of Europeans over Africans and Native Americans could indicate a natural order. A century of ideas linking human complexion to the social fates of particular peoples eased the debate about the fate and place of Native Americans and Africans in Christian prophecy. The status of Jews was also in flux. European Jews were moving throughout the Atlantic world. They invested in Dutch West India and the Royal African Company, 
Um, a single Jew perished with the failed attempt to plant a colony in Roanoke, Virginia in 1585. Sephardim settled in New Netherland. In New Holland, they could act as middlemen, moving enslaved Africans between the Dutch West India Company and the planters. Um, Jewish families formed about 13% of the households in Bridgetown, Barbados, and about 5% of the households in Spitestown, Barbados in the late 17th century. At about the same time, Simon Valentine Vanderwilden left New York City for Charleston, where he became, where he and his partner Mordecai Nathan uh, became shippers and suppliers to the West Indian plantations. Although hostile to the presence of Jews in Jamaica, the planter Edward Long admitted, in fact, the need for, quote, their knowledge of foreign languages and familial networks. In 1733, a group of 42 Jews arrived in the newly formed Georgia colony under the protection of the governor and despite the protest of London proprietors. The politicization of the history of the Jews and the African slave trade has clouded understandings of the cultural transactions captured by these investments, migrations, and shifting statuses. European Jews could and did invest in the chartered slaving companies and Jews in the Americas held slaves in patterns consistent with those of European Christians. A few Jewish merchants, a group, also made fortunes in the Atlantic trade, the slave trade. These Jews could navigate the colonial world precisely because their identities were increasingly in flux. The greatest paradox is how and why Jews in the American colonies achieved some social freedom at the very moment when racial ideas about subjugating, subjugated people, including Jews, were crystallizing. The changing position of colonial Jews resulted from a hardening of beliefs about the origins, nature, and capacities of non-European people, not, in fact, from a growing religious tolerance. The first Jewish students on the American campus, for instance, arrived at the very minute, I'm sorry, about a century after the first Native American students, but at the very moment when racial ideas were crystallizing in the Atlantic world. Paradoxically, European Jews gained acceptance as Native American people um, were being dismissed, erased from the American campus. At the very moment when Christians were doubting the possibility of educating indigenous people, and asserting that the history of the Jews required the isolation or destruction of Indians, whatever their scriptural ancestry. Jews gained access to, the colonial, to colonial colleges as racial thought emerged in the Atlantic world. The Enlightenment's rationalist orientation toward learning opened the study of natural, social, and metaphysical phenomena, including religion itself, to people of different traditions, and created an intellectual space for inclusion. But racial thought was no less a product of the Enlightenment, and it could be used to sustain arguments for the inclusion of Jews and the exclusion of Indians. When European and European-American intellectuals explored Judaism and Jewish history for clues to the origins of Native America, they were also rummaging through the legacies of Christian anti-Semitism. One example. The axiom that God sent plagues and wars to punish Native American communities for heathenism went largely unchallenged in the colonies. And the assignment of Jewish ancestry to Native Americans, however speculative, made this heavenly verdict even more credible. If Indians were Jews under this logic, then they were not the innocent occupants of an unknown land, but unrepentant sinners who had long, perhaps too long, escaped God's wrath. Whatever the lost tribe of Jews peopled the Americas, they still collectively bore Jewish guilt. Cataloging and condemning the atrocities of the Spanish crown and the Catholic Church against the indigenous people of the Americas, the Reverend Thomas Thorogood of New England had nonetheless concluded that all of those brutalities were consistent with, quote, the plagues threatened unto the Jews. It was an, a remarkable uh, moral renovation of, in fact, a human tragedy. When God scattered Israel, one of its tribes found its way to the Americas, as did the wolves and the bears of the forest, the minister surmised, and the Christians who reached American soil thousands of years later delivered a belated but divine vengeance. <clears throat> 
the reconfiguration of colonial society particularly pronounced, was particularly pronounced on campus. In 1762, the Manhattan merchant and King's College trustee John Watts wrote to Moses Franks, the son of the New York slave trader Jacob Franks and Abigail Levy, recommending Dr. James Jay, who has, quote, undertaken to serve our college and I hope may succeed. Franks was operating as the foreign agent for King's College, now Columbia, in Europe. The contributions of Jewish merchants as privateers during the French and Indian War encouraged greater religious tolerance. Judah Hayes, a prominent West India trader, was among the New York merchants whose ships attacked French interests. Moses, Moses Michael Hayes, his son, a founder of Massachusetts Bank and a prominent Freemason, also became a benefactor of Harvard College. Rabbi Gershom Sexus um, later served three decades as a trustee of King's College. Jacob Rodriguez de Rivera of Newport and Aaron Lopez of Newport generously gave to the College of Rhode Island, now Brown, where such gifts moved the trustees to open the college, open college admissions to Jewish students. Rodriguez de Rivera also donated to Yale. By mid-century, mid-18th century, colonial campuses had in fact changed remarkably. In 1750, Isaac Isaacs graduated from Yale. Seven years later, a Jewish student enrolled at the College of Philadelphia, now the University of Pennsylvania. In 1772, Moses Levy finished Philadelphia, Penn, the least restrictive of the colonial colleges. A dozen Jewish students graduated from Philadelphia before the revolution. In that same era, Isaac Abrams completed the undergraduate course at King's College. A woman, Rashea Gratz, was among four Jews in the first graduating class of Franklin College, now Franklin and Marshall. In 1800, Samson Simpson delivered a Hebrew lecture during the Columbia College commencement at St. Paul's Episcopal Chapel in Manhattan. Quote, your request to open my mouth in the Hebrew language, Simon confessed, left me struggling to find a subject worthy of, quote, so great, so respectable an audience. He chose to offer a history of the oldest Jewish community in North America. The Native American presence had simultaneously collapsed on campus. As early as 17, I'm sorry, as early as 1674, Daniel Gukin had confessed that many Puritans took the deaths of Native American students as evidence that God was not yet ready to save them. A decade later, the New England Company, quote, the find that there is only one Indian youth maintained and educated at the college in New England, meaning Harvard. The board wanted 10 Indian students, but most colonists saw few strategic benefits to enrolling additional Indian boys. King Philip's War has, had devastated the New England Indians. The strategic benefits of Native American evangelization had declined with the war. Um, the Native populations were largely conquered. Um, and in its aftermath, uh, it had left a heightened anti-Indian sentiment throughout New England. President Mather, for instance, was still including the ancient Indian Yakums in his new reports on the Christian missions. Harvard's governors, one of the early Native people converted to Christianity. He was actually still including in those reports. Harvard's governors moved the printing press into the Indian College where it was used to publish the Hebrew Bible and other material for English students. Supplies of the Algonquian Bible and catechism were destroyed during King Philip's War, and that inventory, in fact, became a minor concern at Harvard. Dankers and Slider found, two visitors, found that there was virtually no English lang Indian language publications when they called upon John Eliot to learn more about his mission. As Native American education was declining at Harvard, President Increase Mather was in fact distributing copies of the last available Indian language materials to friends at universities in Holland. Samuel Eliot Morrison, the 20th century historian, disdainfully described the Indian Bible as, quote, the least useful publication that came from the Indian college, which he also cast as, quote, this unwanted structure. Indian missions, in fact, became little more than campaign slogans for American colleges raising money in Britain, whose agents, in turn, blamed Native people when confronted with the absence of Indian students 
on campus. Morrison argued that President Henry Dunster had actually only promoted the Indian College to begin with, to get money to actually fix old college and to subsidize English students. In fact, as soon as the building opened, President Charles Chauncey began to flirt with the idea that it could be used for something better than housing Native Americans. He converted the building for the use of Indian boy, uh, for English boys, and in little time, Indians were actually swept from Harvard Yard. The school came to a rather ignoble end. In November 1693, the corporation resolved that, quote, the Indian College be taken down provided that the charges of taking it down amount not to more than five pounds. The board then sought the New England Company's permission to repurpose the bricks, which were eventually sold for 20 pounds. In 1732, the governors of the College of William and Mary in Virginia built um, opposite the president's house, um, Bradford and Hall, the Indian College, which still frames the formal center of the campus. But the Virginians' commitment to Indian education also crumbled rather quickly. And within a few decades, the building was being used to house white students. In fact, actually, by the 19th century, it's housing William Barton Rogers, um, the founder of MIT, whose father had been hired as the chemistry professor. And they move into Brafferton, um, the family moves into Brafferton, and Brafferton has its own supply of slaves, um, slaves assigned to take care of the building. Harvard remained the primary beneficiary of the New England Company, in fact, despite the absence of Native American students. Why? By the mid 18th century, American colonists had new confidence in the natural bases of human difference from which they could justify and project the social hierarchies around them. Once treated as an immutable trait, religious distinctions and cultural distinctions, physiologically distinctions, could not in fact be logically punished out of existence. There was little profit in struggling to uplift Native Americans whom secular knowledge and religious knowledge now judged unsalvageable. In 1730, I'm sorry, 1773, the board of Newark Academy in Delaware, Newark Academy is a small preparatory school um, that actually is the school that um, the current University of Delaware originates from, okay. uh, sent Dr. Hugh Williamson and the Reverend John Ewing, two of their Philadelphia trustees, on a fundraising trip to Britain. The trustees now made no pretense at the education or evangelization of Native people. Rather, their new appeal emphasized the need for academies to meet the demands of a growing colonial population, quote, lest they become as ignorant and as barbarous as the savage Indian nations, their neighbors. Early in the 18th century, Cotton Mather had objected to the idea that people with white skin were privileged before God. He rejected the claim that color had divine meaning but he accepted that it had some meaning. The latter point would have actually been hard to deny. His neighbor's ships were carrying captive Africans to the Southern and West Indian plantations. Merchants were selling enslaved Indians into New England. The military decline of the Algonquian language nations had left numerous Native American communities dependent on and vulnerable to the colonists. The African population of New England had been rising with the slave trade while Europeans were being exempted from servitude. Color had become an obvious indicator of status. Reverend Mather, like his counterparts in Maryland, Virginia, and New York, could encourage the baptism and religious education of slaves, confident that color trumped faith and conversion would not implicate the social position of enslaved people. Anti-Semitism had not, in fact, eroded at that moment. It was rather being incorporated into a new conceptualization of human affairs. The fact that Jewish traders were routinely partnering, partnering with Christian factors, insurers, captain, and crewmen was itself a symptom of an increasingly secular understanding of human relations. Um, I'll use uh, the local merchant Aaron Lopez as an example. In May 1765, Lopez contracted Henry Kruger Jr. of the New York slave trading family 
for guidance as he began trading between England, Africa, and the West Indies. Kruger had relocated to Bristol, England to run that end of the family slaving enterprise, and that relationship cost Lopez 10,000 pounds. But his greatest success, Lopez's greatest success, came after he hired Captain Benjamin Wright, a self-described, quote, Presbyterian old Yankee, with an excellent reputation in the Caribbean and African trades. Quote, as we entertain the highest opinion of your abilities and experience in the trade, um, Lopez and, and Rodriguez de Rivera's 1774 instructions to Captain William English began, in which they gave him, in fact, wide authority to pilot their brigantine Anne and negotiate for slaves on the African coast. Through such relations, Aaron Lopez built a merchant house that included full or part ownership of more than 30 vessels. Lopez is actually an interesting lens into the way in which um, racial and social thought was dramatically shifting in the 18th century world, and the, the way in which that shift pivoted on the slave trade and the demographic transformation of the Americas. On October 13, 1752, Duarte and Ana Lopez landed at Newport, Rhode Island with their daughter Catherine. Benjamin Gomez, a Sephardic Jew from New York City, circumcised Duarte. The Lopez's changed their name to Aaron and Abigail and called their daughter Sarah. They remarried in a Jewish ceremony. These were the final acts, or the, these were acts of emancipation. Exposed as a practicing Jew, Aaron's older brother, Jose, had fled Lisbon, Portugal, fearing persecution. Jose settled in New York City, taking the name Moses before removing to Rhode Island. In Lisbon, the family had worshiped secretly, intermarrying with other Jews, and concealing their faith to avoid discovery. In North America, the Lopez family merged into an open but unequal society. Quote, I'm sorry, the Jews synagogue sat on Mill Street, just south of Wall Street in Manhattan. And the Jews' burial ground lay to the north, beyond the boundaries of the city, where the meadows and trees flanked the road to Boston. Such were the limits of tolerance in a free, between free people. In Newport, Aaron Lopez partnered with Jacob Rodriguez de Rivera. In 1762, a decade after his arrival, Abigail Lopez died, and Aaron Lopez remarried Sarah Rodriguez de Rivera the, uh, um, the following year, the daughter of Jacob Rodriguez de Rivera. Abraham Pereira Mendez, Lopez's son-in-law, an experienced New York trader, worked as his factor in Jamaica. The correspondence of Aaron Lopez records his descent into the miserable business of enslaving human beings. Calibrating the levels of confinement and anguish to maximize the value of human cargoes and calculating financial loss from those who died. Quote, I stepped on board Captain All's ship in order to view the slaves, Pereira Mendez wrote from Kingston to explain the poor returns on one of Lopez's investments. Quote, the reason is because the major part of them are small things, and those that are large has age on their side. In 1766, Lopez's vessels brought nearly 150 enslaved Africans to market in the Caribbean. That same year, he sent the America, his ship, to Portugal to rescue his older brother Michael, or Abraham, his sister-in-law and their children. During his career, in fact, Lopez sent 14 ships to Africa, transporting more than 1,000 human beings into American slavery. <coughs> he kept five black slaves and an Indian servant in his household and his estate approached $100,000 in value. His father-in-law, Jacob Rodriguez de Rivera, held 12 black people in his home. In May 1782, Aaron Lopez drowned at Scott's Pond, just north of Providence, Rhode Island. One of his slaves attempted to rescue him, but failed. Shaken by the death, President Ezra Stiles, who had close ties to Lopez in Rhode Island, wrote, quote, he was a Jew by nation. He was a merchant of first eminence. For honor and extent of commerce probably surpassed by no merchant in America, without a single enemy and the most universally beloved by an extensive acquaintance of any man I ever knew. His bene bene beneficence um, to family connections, to his nation, and to all the world is almost without parallel. 
He was my intimate friend and acquaintance. Ezra Stiles' eulogy also expressed great regret that his friend died a Jew. Quote, oh, how often I have wished that sincere, pious, and candid mind could have perceived the evidences of Christianity, the Yale president lamented. Quote, perceived the truth as it is in Jesus Christ, known that Jesus was the Messiah predicted by Moses and the prophets. The relationship between Stiles and Lopez and Stiles' reading of that moment provides a peek into how and why American intellectuals were able to incorporate Jewish history and the history of anti-Semitism into a deeply racialized vision of national and social progress in the late 18th century. Exactly one year after, exactly one year after Aaron Lopez's death, the Reverend Everest Stiles issued a sermon celebrating the Treaty of Paris and the end of the American Revolution. He lauded the rise of the whites, whose numerical growth alone proved divine favoritism. God intended the Americas, he, he wrote, quote, for a new enlargement of Japheth, reclaiming the curse of Canaan um, from the Old Testament. He defensively insisted that Protestants had faithfully purchased Indian land to erase any sense of historical wrong. He crafted a bizarre defense of conquest in that sermon. The surviving Indians benefited from colonialism, he would argue, since the value of their remaining territories had increased thousands of times. Projecting the growth of the white population to 300 million, Reverend Stiles predicted, quote, a constant increasing revenue to the sachems and original lords of the soil for whatever lands the survivors could hold on to. That odd rationalization of a human tragedy was made worse by Pre President Stiles' confidence that any remaining social injustices would disappear with Native Americans and Africans themselves, whose decline in his mind seemed inevitable. It was God's good providence, he continued, that the vanishing of non-white people would also erase the moral problem of dispossession and enslavement. Breaking with a long theological tradition, Stiles, in fact, rewrote the Old Testament narrative that explained the rise of slavery in the Americas. Filled with allusions to superior blood and other suggestions of European supremacy, President Stiles' sermon exposed the tight braiding of 18th century thought. Quote, can we contemplate their present and anticipate their future increase and not be struck with astonishment to find ourselves in the midst of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Noah. Jewish merchants and Jewish students in the colonies may well have found some social freedom, but it was in an unstable, treacherous, and situational whiteness. The passing of the matriculating Indians and the coming of the Sephardim was not in fact an inevitable step in the development of the American colonies the inclusion of Jews resulted from the evolution of new arguments about human populations. Sorry. I grabbed one too many pages when I switched over. Okay. It might well be seductive to read the story of the emancipation and rise of the Lopez and Rodriguez de Rivera families as a singular tale of Jewish redemption and African persecution. But that focus risks diminishing the actual saga of modern slavery. Jews in the transatlantic slave trade and living in the Christian slave colonies operated within an evolving racial civilization from which few subjugated people would escape. Racial beliefs created space for the social incorporation of Jews in the Atlantic world precisely at the moment that they began to question the humanity of Jews in the Atlantic world. The ascendance of, biological racism, of the biological racism that questioned the humanity of non-European people also redefined social relations among people of European descent. Early racial categorization traced human color and geography, Asians, Africans, Europeans, and Americans, but it did not take long for Atlantic intellectuals to question whether such regional and complexional fissures 
were the only evidence of divine or natural favoritism. If dark skin was a timeless indicator of inferiority, then there were likely also indicators of Jewish cultural, spiritual, and even biological inequality. In fact, the very history of frustrated Christian missions and failed conversion crusades made Christian anti-Semitism receptive to racialization. Jewish emancipation was neither absolute nor unconditional. The ascendance of scientific and theological racism revived anti-Semitism by rupturing the humanist underpinnings of Judeo-Christian philosophy, which as Alf Albert Lindemann argues, freed Western philosophy to quote, introduce various other refinements within the hierarchy of, 18, of 18th century thought, including in fact, um, arguments for biblically based racial categories. In the end then, what part of um, the reason why this moment in 18th century history becomes so important to us is that in fact actually there, it really calls for us to think carefully and critically about the ways in which the histories of African Americans, Native Americans, um, colonial Jews actually get braided together in the 18th, 18th century world and can never be understood without reference to each other. Thank you. I should say that the library was kind enough, thoughtful enough, and brilliant enough to actually um, display some of the early 17th, 18th century text upon which this talk was given, or actually displayed in the back. So. Yes, ma'am. I mean, I, th I think the most um, immediate answer is actually the, ex you know, we have to remember the way in which the Bible actually provided the history of the world um, for Europe in the, in the period of expansion. Um, so that the Bible was in fact the chronology of human history. And therefore, as um, Adrian Vanderdonk, the Dutch attorney um, who's you know, describing the Mohawk, as he points out, um, if you can't explain the origins of Native Americans using the, um, the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, then in fact actually all of Judeo-Christian thought becomes, Judeo-Christianity becomes a regional religion if it can't explain the globe. And so in fact actually that pressure is there immediately. Um, and so for, you can see this also in New Spain. Um, I've been working recently on um, Catholics, the Catholic Church and slavery. Um, and in New Spain in the um, 16th and particularly the 16th century, early 17th century, there's quite a bit of activity among the religious orders, um, theorizing and creating, in fact, a history, a biblical history that's consistent um, and that explains the Americas and incorporates the Americas. Well, wait, wait, I should say we do say that. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that that's actually comes right in the next century. Uh, yeah. 
Go ahead. Weaken yeah. that argument. Well, um, no, not, not particularly. Remember, actually, that when um, Menashe ben Israel actually publishes that treatise, when the treatise on the um, you know <coughs> discovering um, the lost tribe in the Cordilleras Mountains is published, that becomes extraordinarily popular among theologians, um, and is used, in fact, as as immediate evidence of um, and authenticating. Um, and um, Ben Israel's willingness to add credence to it um, actually really gives it a kind of status um, for Christian intellectuals on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, you know, we're in New England, and I, I don't like to describe this as a kind of conspiratorial, it's not that they're, um, it's that in the worldview that they're holding, this must be true. And so what one is searching for is evidence of the truth. And you find it everywhere. There's actually a really wonderful historical text that talks about this in a more global way, um, and that points out that in that next century, Christians will find lost tribes all over the world. Right? There, there are lost tribes throughout Asia. There are lost tribes throughout the Americas. There are lost tribes in Africa. Um, and so we're and we often, in fact, with that, they're attaching pieces of evidence um, that they glean from language, from culture, from habit, from style, from dress, from location and from the um, narratives, the internal narratives of these societies, much the way that um, uh, Megapolensis uses the Iroquoian creation story to immediately attach it to the Cain and Abel story. Right. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I Where the entangled history is going? Right, where, yeah. uh, because you mentioned that this might be uh, further research for, yeah. for, for the production of the new study. Oh. No, that's more ambitious than I want to be at this point. <laughs> 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 right now I'm trying to sleep. The, uh, but yeah, actually, in fact, this talk came from, there were, in the Ebony and Ivy book, there were five chapters that got removed over time uh, because it was about 200 long, pages longer than um, the book that was published. Um, and so I lived in discomfort with those five chapters for a long time. And this was the last one to be removed. It was the one that I was holding on to the longest, in part because I think working through this relationship between how one tells the story of you know, the arrival of European Jews into the American colonies, the Sephardim in particular, um, the Native American history and African American history simultaneously. The problem of wrestling with that and understanding what the language is for actually explaining, the, and for the fact that we have to explain the relationship between these populations of people, or we will never understand their experiences. Right? Um, you know, I, I believe, in fact, that you know, modern racial thought has as its foundations um, early modern anti-Semitism. Early modern anti-Semitism is the scaffolding from which we actually build, in fact, a body of new ideas that emerged by the 19th century into a sort of crystallized, racialized vision of the world. Um, and that, that element is never really removed. And so in part, for me, the real challenge has been wrestling with how to um, discover a language for talking about these experiences um, that will help me actually think through all of my work as an American historian, not only this problem, but in fact, you know, with the realization that this problem reminds me that you know, African American history, American history, the history of Native Americans are always in dialogue. Just a last couple of questions, and we have time to at least You've been waiting for me. I think that's a really profound idea. I really, I think you're really catching something to talk about this, this idea of a loss Israel and America being a justification for colonialism and conquest and things like that. But I, I have to wonder in the 17th century if we, if we think the English and the Dutch really believed it. And I'm thinking about the treatment 
by the Dutch and English of indigenous people versus the way that they treat Jewish people in the, in the colonies specifically. Right. All the way from, uh, from Aperibo and Dutch Guyana to Barbados, as you mentioned, Jamaica, colonial New York, and you know, Rhode Island. You know, there's such a, there seems like there's such a, a difference in the way that Jewish people are being perceived and treated in the way that indigenous people are being specifically the violence. Right. Absolutely. Open violence. No, I, I think you're right. You know, and in part, actually, what you're wrestling with, it's the, it's the paradox at the center of this. You know, the, the problem I was wrestling with um, when I was looking through this history, and in part, it's actually, um, to explain it better, when I started out doing this, this book project, I didn't initially intend to first write a book about colleges and slavery. That was the last thing on my mind. Uh, and, I, but as I started getting deeper and deeper into the subject, sort of committing over time the way historians do, um, I like to suggest that we commit two and a half years at a time. We, we keep you know, pretending that it's only going to be another two years. Um, <laughs> and then every two year, years we renew that false contract. Um, but you know, in that process, one of the things that I was encountering was the, um, that I couldn't help but avoid noticing. Um, I probably avoided, I, I noticed it earlier, I particularly noticed it here because I was looking at the sort of intellectual culture of the colonies, um, the persistent presence of Old Testament references, but particularly references to Jewish history in the uh, attempts of um, Christians to really think about and explore the moral problem of both slavery and conquest. And so that's, that's the paradox. The paradox is actually, how is it when you look at the campuses that at the very moment that there's what some scholars might refer to as a liberalization of policy, you know, when Fred Rudolph, um, the um, historian of higher education um, for, for many decades at Williams College, when Fred Rudolph wrote his histories, one of the things he liked to celebrate was what he referred to generally as a kind of um, liberal element or, or, or culture among the denominational schools in which they weren't sort of exclusionary. Well, they were, um, but they actually did liberalize at certain points in time. They did expand. And so in the 1750s, you have the coming of, um, to campus of actual Jewish students who are arriving as Jews, unlike monists and not being forced to convert, they're actually arriving as Jews. And that that's happening at the same time that a really quite deep, entrenched, hard, fatalistic vision of the destruction of Native American peoples is emerging. And that that vision of the, of the fate of Native people is actually rooted in the same Old Testament claims and actually drawing upon the same history. And so that's, that was the paradox for me. It's how do you struggle with those two things? And you're asking it, in, in fact, in a different way. And my answer is actually that um, the, for me as a, as a historian, part Part of the way that I explain that is actually by remembering that anti-Semitism isn't in decline at that moment. Anti-Semitism is being incorporated into a new expansive vision of human populations, which is capable of actually embracing or incorporating um, a, a more global vision of the relationship between human populations, but in fact a far more a, a, a destructive vision of the roots and the um, destiny of those relationships. Okay. I'll answer it again with more water. Professor <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. uh, Thanks very much for your fascinating talk. And excuse my English. I have not uh, an historical question to do, but um, uh, ethnographical comment to draw, uh, an ethnographical anecdotal comment, and which may be related with uh, Tatiana's question. Uh, I was in Mexico City uh, investigating about uh, my research about the narratives in uh, the Mexican studying the inquisitorial documents, which are fabulous, of many themes, items, and about the matter of the And there, I was told about a Jewish Indian 
a respected scholar like Seymour Griezmann, author of the history of the Jews in Mexico, which is published in the 70s, which is still today a reference book. And he published an article about not the uh, Jewish Indians, but about the Jewish mestizos. Well, so I was, of course, very interested by this enigma and trying, as I did always, to join past and present. Well, uh, I was very interested to um, do field work to study the contemporaneous narratives. Well, and of course, I were, we were to visit this group in Lendaprieta, uh, which is uh, one hour from Mexico City. Mexico City is standing so long that there is no, almost integrated to the uh, agglomeration. Well, and it was sufficient to be able to observe that they are not an Indian. Um, articles were uh, <coughs> uh, have the title uh, of not only uh, Jewish Indians but Jewish Aborigines. Other publications like this. Well, these people, when you read them, so seems like all other Mexicans, well, watch, which uh, mean that you have all type of uh, physical uh, appearance, and for the group, the argument is that they are descendants of the new Christians, of the conversos, who were uh, so persecuted by the Jewish Palestine. Well, and I began uh, working with this group, but not so long because uh, are there really descendants of the new Christians? Maybe, maybe um, the genealogical depth. Uh, the depth of the genealogical memory is not so long. And when I knew some years after the uh, contemporaneous Marans of Brazil, well, I abandoned the study of this group <laughs> because in Bra Brazil, as I will have maybe opportunity to explain, uh, Brazil, the Portuguese area, uh, present the best condition for uh, extraordinary conservation of Maran memory. Excuse me, mm -hmm. but it was only to uh, give uh, other, um, other panorama. I hope it's not too far from. No, no, no. It's, my, my only fear is as we get closer to the present, I get less confident. Uh, but, but I think you know, the new Christians are, are, are different than the lost tribes. And so you know, the two arguments actually are, are important ones. I wanted to come back to this question too, it's, it's just in conclusion. You know, I think part of the challenge for us as you know, someone who grew up in New York City, in, in, in Brooklyn of all places, um, you know, I recognizing the, the significance of this day in the history of Brown, um, there, there's a noble way to say this, and there's a less noble way, which is more honest. The less noble way is with Jane and Tony in the audience. I didn't really want to talk about Brown all that much. Um, but, you know, the, but I also wanted to talk about a topic that I think actually is central to, a central challenge to American historians today. Having grown up in New York in the 1980s and 1990s at the low point, in fact, of black Jewish relations in New York City, um, you know, it's the obligation, part of the moral obligation of historians is to bring these histories back into dialogue, which requires, in fact, asking very difficult questions um, and making ourselves vulnerable to the answers to them. Um, and I couldn't imagine a better event to at least, you know, contribute to that process than this one. And so thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you.